first question I want to ask you is, why does the city need a general plan and specifically a land use and circulation element? Well, there are really two reasons. One is, of course, the state law requires it the way all communities in California are ultimately um, manage their resources, their infrastructure, their land use, their transportation is through the general planning process. But the reason it's so important, separate from being required, is that if you think about it, without a general approach, without a strategy, it would be, um, you know, a ship without a course. Without a strategy, what you get is piecemeal development. You may get a lot of, let's say, suburban residential development without any of the mom and pop shops that you need to really make a complete neighborhood. You don't integrate your transportation. You don't integrate your infrastructure. And what you get is is just whatever the market feels like doing at that point in time. So what a general plan does is says, here's what we're going to do over the next 20 years. Here's what our vision is. Here's what we need to do at each phase to achieve that. Here's what we will and here's what we won't allow. The city did its last land use element in 1984. Yes. What came true? What didn't come true? Well, much of that, that element was what would be considered a growth plan. In other words, the element took place at a point in time when there was a lot of desire to, um, to build, uh, to bring office into the community, to build the community's fiscal base. So what you see, or what you saw, was the, what was in the general plan was built out. And it was, there were a lot of things in the general plan that were very good. There were generally a protection of neighborhoods. But at that point in time, they didn't have the tools. In other words, there would be the zoning, let's protect the neighborhood, but there were not the tools to keep some of these smaller apartment buildings from being ripped down. There were not the tools to transition uh, with overlay districts to keep neighborhoods uh, to keep their character and scale. So a lot of the policies were were very reasonable. They didn't have the tools. And then, of course, the other issue is um, with the amount of office, there were also the, the land use plan was done separately from the circulation element. It was not integrated. So the land use was looked at without looking at traffic impacts, transit, how to move people differently. So that was probably the uh, couple of the, the bigger uh, differences in terms of, and, and today, of course, we look at everything from a standpoint of, we, do we want this? Is this going to contribute? And what kind of benefit should it contribute? And in 1984, it wasn't structured that way. You mentioned before the need to have a general plan to deal with economic forces. What were the economic forces in the last couple of decades that resulted in getting some things that we wanted and some things we didn't anticipate from the 84 plan? I th the economic forces were, of course, there was a lot of um, market. You know, Santa Monica is an incredible location. There are very few locations like this in the country. So there was a tremendous market for residential. There was also a tremendous market for office. So the, um, and there was also a market here for retail. So the, what happened is each of those sectors developed what there wasn't in place, for example, was an urban design element. There were for spe some specific areas like the downtown, but really clear guidelines that if you're going to develop residential, exactly how are you going to do that in that residential and that infill? Or if you're going to have uh, creative arts or office, what kind of office? Do we want regional office or do we really just want local because we don't want the, the traffic that comes with regional? So the issue was that the plan was about uses and locations. It was not the tools we have today where we say, well, a little bit of office may be okay because we want a dentist's office and we want a doctor's office, 
but we need small floor plates and we need that near the hospital. We don't need, you know, a regional serving corporate headquarters. So it was the, the, it was the coordination with the other elements and it was really the fine tuning that we've been doing over the last year that you didn't have in 84. So how does this plan try and look at appropriate uses on a more granular, granular level as you're suggesting? Well, that has been the whole discussion with the community. Um, as uh, you, you may be aware, there were uh, 12 workshops with anywhere from 100 to 150 people attending. Um, there were 18 public hearings. And the real issue was people very easily came to consensus on the vision. We want a dynamic city, a healthy city, we want more open space, we want less traffic, we want to be able to move around more easily, um, we want our local services, we want to be able to walk rather than have to get in our car and drive across town, we want buildings that contribute to the pedestrian environment rather than are these massive hulks that overwhelm our neighborhoods. So the vision was the part that we saw consensus from really the residential, business, all aspects of the community. The part that is, of course, the much tougher is how do you make sure all of this happens? So what um, we did, based on what the community said, we heard very clearly from the community that they did not feel that there was enough input an evaluation into the types of projects that had evolved over the years. So that was the big message. So the plan um, set up a structure that's very different than our structure today. It set up a structure with a very low, um, a base. In other words, you can build up to 30 feet, which is two and a half to three stories, and you can, can do that under today's guidelines. But if you want to go above that, because today you can go to 45 feet, what we're saying, if you want to go above that, and we tried to listen to the community and the council very much, as it was the commission, wanted to make sure that we stayed within the existing zoning envelope, which is much lower than the general plan, that you have to go through a very public process. You have to go through a process where the public not only is part of identifying what the benefits or what's expected, but really identifying is this the right project with the right benefits in the right location, and does all of this really make our quality of life better? That, so, so ultimately the answer is structuring a process where there's a tremendous amount of participation and involvement so that people really have what will be phased over time so that uh, people can look at what is taking place, measure what's taking place, and make sure that whatever new comes in is something they, they have input into and some control over. That was really, is really the biggest distinction. Now, as a follow-up to that, we know that it's not legal to do spot zoning. So we know that the community wants input. We know that developers want predictability. How, if somebody wants to develop something, how are they going to know and how's the community going to be able to really ascertain down to the level of really what kind of uses fit for what intersection, what neighborhood to make it the kind of walkable integrated plan that you're talking about? Well, first of all, in terms of what we've seen in the last several months, we have seen where we've identified areas that the community has said we want creative arts, like in the industrial area, and we've said, and we want roads, and we want open space, and we want workforce housing, and we want affordable housing. It's been very interesting that some of the projects that have approached the city have said, we're willing to do all of that even knowing that they're entering into a completely discretionary process, um, a process whereby they'll go through public hearings and they, they may or may not get approved. So the interesting aspect is that 
if a community doesn't ask for a wider sidewalk, ground level, open space, workforce housing, no one's going to offer it up. So the first piece is it's been fascinating to see that laying out some of the general expectations, the response from the development community. But the second part of your question was, so, so the developers, if the developers know generally what is expected of them, of course they still take a risk, part of the, the business in um, development industry, if you want to be in a community with the quality and the character of Santa Monica, it's a community with a tremendous amount of public input. So that's part of what they factor into. They factor into their, um, uh, their expectation. But they know at least what is generally expected of them. And there will be a lot more involvement of the community in really defining, uh, and specifically for specific areas, what are the parameters. There's a lot of discussion. Uh, right now as to what are the kinds of things people expect. Well, that we expect wide sidewalks. We're looking for ground level open space. You know, interestingly, the, um, the code doesn't require it now. The reason you don't see it is it's not required. And we've heard that over and over. Uh, we're looking, obviously, the community has said we want affordable housing, we want some workforce housing. but. Overridingly, we hear from the community that if you're going to build something, for example, in um, the industrial area, that you have to provide other ways of getting there. They know the community has really spoken very clearly, we do not want this kind of traffic. If something is going to take place, whether they're providing their own shuttles, whether they're creating what we call transportation demand management systems. All of this is part of what the community is putting together for expectations. And, um, and so this will be laid out, and then it will be laid out more specifically, of course, at the zoning stage. So it does tell the development community, if you want to build in Santa Monica, you have to be able to manage and cut your traffic significantly, and you have to provide these other aspects. And even with that, you have to go through a process with a tremendous amount of public input. You talked a lot about benefits, and I want to come back to that. But you also mentioned that the zoning will further articulate what the community wants to see in different parts of the city. Traditionally, with the east-west corridors, we've had a set of permitted uses for those corridors. Do you anticipate breaking up the corridors into smaller districts and defining acceptable uses on a more local level? Oh, absolutely. Um, Pico is a good example. Um, if you look at what is laid out in the land use and circulation element, the general plan, well, Pico has been divided into, I want to say, six or seven areas because you have an area right across the street from the college that should be a walking and a retail area and they should have those kind of uses. You also have areas right as you approach Lincoln that have a completely different character. And um, as, you, uh, as we go east in the city, on the northern side of the street particularly, but there is very little depth between the commercial boulevard and the residential neighborhoods. So the, um, the, the land use and circulation element identifies the need for transitions into those neighborhoods so that you can't do, you can't build what perhaps if you were going to completely redevelop an area you would build because there has to be the sensitivity. But also there are many areas going east that have blocks that are a thousand feet long. There's no connection to the neighborhood. So it's breaking those blocks, doing a lower scale, and then identifying what, what we heard from the neighbor hoods where they want uses that they can walk to. They want services just like everyone else. So defining each of those areas much more specifically. How does the relatively high cost of land present challenges to this plan? The high cost of land in Santa Monica? 
You know, it's an interesting question. The land costs are high, of course, because the area is so desirable. What the Planning Commission and the Council have asked us as staff to do is now evaluate um, the feasibility of all of these public benefits. For example, in the industrial area, the, uh, and again, when we say the plan, it's really, at this point, a general strategy that has to be evaluated, and then after all of that economic and traffic impact is evaluated, then Council will um, send forward a final draft. So this is not yet even at the stage of a final draft. But what we ha would evaluate, for example, in the industrial area is if you have a site, and um, let's take a site where there's a desire to put uh, some workforce housing, the city and the community feel there need to be at least one street through the site to break up these massive blocks and so people can move around. Uh, the community has identified the desire for local serving retail. Uh, we've talked about the need for creative arts, and if you go anything above two stories, uh, you, you have to provide the creative arts, but then you would provide workforce or affordable housing. So what we've been looking at is if you give the ground level open space that the community has asked for, if you do, in one case, uh, we have a site where there is some historic preservation and adaptive reuse. Uh, if you also step back from the residential community, if you also provide all of the transportation inducements to move people out of their cars, can a project develop? And what we know at this point, again, we're just, we're just starting all of the detailed economic analysis, but particularly in the industrial areas, the answer is generally yes that the um, that you can get those types of benefits and have those kinds of expectations and you can say to um, a project that is let's say part affordable housing part creative arts we need you to reduce your trips by 50 percent and they can do it uh, Rand Corporation does it Water Garden interestingly enough does it so we know that on some of those larger sites that all of this works. What we're now looking at is some of the smaller sites. Take a site on Wilshire Boulevard. If someone wants to go, which is all with allowable within our existing zoning today, except you don't have all these other requirements in the zoning to get a better project, but if someone wants to go another floor above 30 feet, can they do the below ground parking, perhaps shared parking with the neighborhood, as well as some of these other benefits and have a project that um, pencils out? Uh, we believe the answer will be yes. It will be, um, there's of course going to be a relationship that you may uh, get at the City Council may decide in some cases they want to keep the much lower scale projects rather than get the public benefits and that in other areas that the, the, the benefits like the open space and the affordable housing and the infrastructure are critical. But that's, the, that's what we're going through right now is looking at exactly what's the maximum amount of affordable housing or the maximum amount of public benefit you can get for the minimum amount of height and scale. And that was council's direction. They were very clear. They said this is a low scale community and they directed us to look at significant reductions from the old general plan. For example, Wilshire Boulevard is 84 feet in the old general plan. They said stay to the extent possible within the existing zoning. So with a uh, very couple of exceptions, I think 98.8% of what's being evaluated is much lower than our old general plan and within our existing zoning envelope, 
It's just that we're providing more community input and more process and more expectations of what would take place within that envelope. Can, can you clarify for our, our viewers what's the difference between heights in the general plan, heights in the zoning? Why is there a difference? Sure. Typically, a general plan identifies the maximum that a, a jurisdiction or community would consider. And then the zoning comes in, let's say Wilshire Boulevard, the general plan says under certain circumstances you could be 84 feet. And the, the, zoning, the current plan says the that? The current general plan says that. And how many stories is that? 84 feet if you looked at a 15 foot base with commercial would be 15 from 85 would be, so it would be seven to eight stories, basically, depending on residential or commercial. Um, the zoning provides for 45 feet under the existing zoning, um, under a, a set of, uh, and there, there are some, there is some criteria for that. It's not just completely um, a blank slate, but there is not the transportation and the traffic impact and that kind of criteria. And then if you're providing affordable housing, you could go up to 55 feet. So that's today's zoning. So what was done, what the council directed us to do is they said, with the exception of a couple areas, and I'll identify them, you stay within that zoning envelope that we have today. We don't want to, we never want to even consider going up to what would be allowed under the, um, the general plan umbrella. So what that means is if a project would come in today, they could say, well, the zoning allows, let's say, up to 55 feet if I have affordable housing, but I want to do these other things and through a development agreement or some other source, I'd like to go up to 65 feet. Um, a good example of that would be the village project um, across from City Hall where they were providing a very large amount of open space, uh, a park, and a very uh, large amount, over 300 units, um, I believe, of affordable housing. And they came to the city and to the community and said, we'd like to go within the general plan, but above what the existing zoning is. And that was granted in exchange for all these other benefits. The council is saying to us, we want to lower that whole envelope. We want to stay, with the exception of a couple of areas, again, a little over 1.2% of the city, we want to stay within the existing zoning so that we get all of those benefits and all of those special elements, and it's within existing zoning. And we don't even want to consider or allow for a possibility that someone would go higher. So that's a big decision. That's a big difference in that now the top is really the existing zoning that someone could not in the future come in and say, but I could do this and go higher. And then you say that in 1.2% of the city, you're considering doing something different. Why did you choose those areas and what are you considering doing differently? Um, that's a, a question, a really good question, because it gets at the heart, and I'm looking at a, a map here, which, which we'll provide to you. Um, there were, first of all, almost all the boulevards are within the existing zoning, even though we would like to see some residential, and we would like to see, we, basically, the, what the direction of the strategy of the general plan is to say, Rather than have any development spread out through the city, it can only take place on our transit corridors. So we will be looking at the neighborhoods to put overlay districts and other things in the neighborhoods to further con control the scale of anything that can take place in the future beyond what is done today. So now you're looking at only transit corridors, which are the boulevards and a couple of the locations for transit with the new uh, light rail. 
So there are three areas. One is the Bergamot area, which would be right on top of where the light rail station would take place. And where in the city is that? Uh, Bergamot is north of Cloverfield. It's what we look at as our industrial area now. It's in the eastern portion of the city. It's where the Bergamot um, arts uh, community is today. It's north of Cloverfield. It is or north um, east of Cloverfield, north of the freeway, somewhere between uh, Olympic, Colorado, Nebraska, in that area on the eastern end of the city. And it's the area where today you see the industrial uses and the, the Bergamot arts community. So that is where a light rail station is going. And so that is one area where the council and the commission were really in agreement that first that area should be primarily creative arts, not open to general office. Um, secondly, because that will be the center for our arts, meaning film, artistic, uh, production, all of the things that have to do with the arts community. So that would be the basis rather than you know, concrete plants or that kind of thing. Or in that area, um, right now there are car dealerships allowed and that would come out. It would be primarily a center for the arts. Uh, secondly, it would have the transit. Third, there need to be streets, sidewalks, open space. If you're going to create an area, some local serving uses that you can have any residential. Right now, you have residential going in in the form of artist housing. You know, a hundred unit projects that have no sidewalks, no open space, no amenities plopped in there. So that, and then that was an area where if you want to go above a couple of stories, you would have to provide the, the open space, the infrastructure. Um, there's also the Memorial Park area where it was discussed, building over the freeway, creating a park over the freeway. Um, that was one area, so Bergamot was one area where council looked at a little bit higher envelope, and that's actually the one area where they said, let's look at, uh, because it's right on top of the train, let's look at the possibility of some of it being 65 feet as an average for the highest. In other words, you could have a project that could maybe have a portion of it that would go a little bit higher, but the average could not be greater. But that would mean, but the base they put in was 45 feet, which you have today. That would mean you would be providing affordable housing, you would be providing streets, you would be creating neighborhoods, you would be doing a tremendous amount to even be considered for that. So the base they kept low as it is today, but they added, and the reason they, um, they did, and the community um, generally endorsed this, it's on top of the transit station. If we're going to start getting rid of trips, let us put where, wherever, if people are coming to work or people are coming to live, let's create what we call complete neighborhoods. Let's stick it right on top of transit. Cities like San Francisco and California are changing their parking standards near public transit lines and requiring less parking Absolutely. as a way of making it more affordable and simply taking cars off the street. Is that contemplated? in a situation around Bergamon or other zones where development would go in near public transit? That is contemplated when you are right on top of the transit. For example, Bergamot would be a good example where you would, well first of all, any the commercial development there would be an expectation of a 50 percent reduction in what would be their normal number of trips and you say, well how do you achieve that? It's not that hard. You set up a district, a train, what we call a transportation management district, and you say, okay, within this district, you're going to charge X for parking, and you're going to give X plus something for incentives if people take the train, 
You're going to also provide shuttles, so you will identify within that district perhaps where some of the commuters come from. You will provide shuttles. One of the things that's recommended across the board and council endorsed is a traffic impact fee and council wants to see this go forward as quickly as possible but that everything will pay, all, all projects will pay a significant transportation impact fee. Now I know some people have discussed the fact that several years ago this was discussed but it was never finalized, discussed, it was not finalized, where would it apply, how will it happen. That basis has all been laid out here so the city is really ready to go forward. So when you, you take a fee, when you charge um, a greater amount for parking or limit the parking, when you incentivize people so that they may be saving $200 a month if they take that train, or you provide the means in terms of a shuttle, um, uh, and when I say a shuttle, uh, shuttle that may just go to that area, people will move, will modify their behavior. Uh, greatest example is RAND. RAND Corporation, and, and like I say, interestingly enough, the uh, Water Gardens, they cut the trips that would be normally anticipated by 50% because they incentivize and disincentivize. If you have to make a decision about paying a certain amount for parking versus actually being paid to take the transit, and it's easy and it's doable, that's how you get people out of their cars. Before we leave the industrial zone, I have two follow-up questions, and then we can talk about other areas in the city where you're looking at doing things substantially different. Uh, one question from an economic standpoint is the city's economic health has long been based on having a variety of income streams and having an industrial zone provided a different economic basis than the standard commercial um, office or retail or tourism. How does the new plan for this corridor affect the city's diversity of income streams? The plan is very clear about protecting it it's just that it's protected on a smaller scale. In other words, instead of the sort of the unlimited amount of each of the um, economic elements, the plan is more um, focused. We the plan very much supports the the uh, hotel industry, but in specific locations, the hotel industry um, is actually one of the areas where you have minimal trips. You would think it would be the opposite. People, particularly uh, foreign visitors, come to the hotels, they come by shuttle and they walk. So that is one sector. The industrial area would not be primarily a visitor area. The industrial area would be really the main area where you would have your other diversity you would have now your creative arts area, which would have the whole range of art and production, um, the everything from artists to TV to digital, that whole range would be there, which is a major part of our economy. Then going further west, the area that's industrial, we recommended, we and the community recommended and the Commission and Council keeping it industrial so that we have and not having housing and other uses which are now uh, can go in. What is an example of an industrial use that might remain in Santa Monica? The kinds of uses where you go out to buy marble, uh, where you, um, I'm thinking of as you come down Colorado Avenue, um, Colorado West, you have a whole range of uses, if you think of that area as where tacos por favor is, you, you can go back there and you can get things that you need for your home, you can get, there's also an, almost an element of design studios and, and those kind of uses. Now that area also is the area where you would have um, the car, uh, car repair, car storage. So the car repair and car storage, rather than being spread out throughout this entire area, 
it would come away from the transit area because the transit area, you don't need to have five acres of car lots next to a train. That's where you need to have your jobs and your, your housing. But as you move further west, um, particularly if you think about coming down Colorado, uh, coming down Olympic, those uses that you see today, the hope would be to keep many of those uses and take housing out of that area because housing's what drives up the value so that we keep that area for the, the, the uses that people in the community rely on um, so that you don't have to go to another city. And then as you go close, closer to Bergamot and the transit station, you really are looking at your creative art space and your workforce housing in your neighborhood. One of the, uh, the other follow-up I want to ask you about the industrial area is one of the concerns from the adjacent Sunset Park neighborhood is that they've suffered uh, through a lot of pass-through traffic through their neighborhood to get to the rest of Santa Monica. And their concern is if too much development happened along the Olympic Corridor, it would only exacerbate that. How does this plan meet or not meet those concerns? Well, those we've heard, the Sunset Park community has been very involved in the plan and they've been very, very clear um, about those issues. First of all, the, the Bergamot area, that is where around the train station that the focus is. And as I said, as you go further east, or no, further west, you, which towards Sunset Park, that area is not only being kept industrial, but some of the development pressures should be taken off it because the things like workforce housing and stuff, I'm not workforce, things like artist housing and the projects they're seeing happen today are being taken out of that district. Now, um, with that said, uh, people in Sunset Park still have some concern about uh, Bergamot and one of the things they've been very clear about is they want to see a connection between surety that the train is going in and you know what is what is built there so a uh, kind of a phasing let's okay let's know that we really have alternative means of transportation and we we believe in terms of the timing that um, that'll be a factor that the the um, and the council also supported that that will be taken into consideration we expect the uh, light rail to be in within four to five years, but their point is let's make sure before there's a lot of change in this area that people do have alternative means of getting around. So that's one issue. Their other issue, of course, is the traffic in general. And one of the, the most significant aspects of this plan, if you think about it, it's not this plan versus nothing happening. Without the plan, you don't have any change in traffic. And what I mean by that, whether you, regardless of the amount you build, that you can't deal with traffic just in terms of saying, you know, we'll, we'll limit residential here or we'll limit commercial there. We've really got to change the ability of people to get around in the city. The major focus here in the plan is let's A, through um, measures like impact fees and through very clear requirements, let's make sure that we can put in place districts where we really are able to reduce the trips by 50%. One of the things the council recommended, and this goes very much to the Sunset Park neighborhood, was no net new trips. And what that means is that on any new project, there would be a huge reduction, but we also simultaneously, we need to reduce our existing trips, that the city cannot be passive. The, we can't do a lot about what's coming through um, and uh, the large majority of the trips in the city are external. They, they come through I-10, uh, people going from one place to another. When you look at the amount of traffic that is going to take place with all the growth on our borders, we can't control that. What we can control are our internal trips. And the way you do that is 
you put these districts in place, you make sure that there is a requirement not only for reduction in future, but that when you put the district in place that the existing businesses can then become part of that district so they can reduce their trips. Um, we, How does that happen? Well, you put a district in place and the, uh, what you would have would be some shuttles. What you would have would be connections to the transit. And so you would include all of the existing businesses. Um, you may, let's take an area like Wilshire, you may want to have shared parking so that rather than everybody building their own parking and everybody having their own trip, you have um, a shared parking in, let's say, one of the activity centers, which would re mean actually less cars in total, but you, you then would disincentivize through cost the parking and you would incentivize, but you'd have to provide some, whether they be short-term shuttles or some jitneys, as well as all of the biking um, apparatus. And that means everything from putting in the pass and the connecting pass, which people are willing to bike. People bike 15 miles, literally, to RAN. But they need showers. They need some of these bike paths continued. So all of that has to be put in place. So you create the districts. You create the infrastructure, which is not 20 years off. This is stuff that can be done in the next few years. And um, our schools, one of the major efforts this year is going to be to work with the schools to identify ways to reduce the number of, of trips that take place with the schools to, to help them. Uh, the hospitals are very interested in looking at uh, serious what we call transportation demand management district for the two hospitals to start to reduce all of the number of trips, particularly of the employees. Easier to reduce it, obviously, of employees than it is in someone who's having a baby. They're probably still going to come, not by bike. A skeptic might argue that you could make these infrastructure changes without having new development, and might also argue that it's counterintuitive to say, more development would lead to less traffic. Is development funneled in a different way in this plan than previously that would allow a change in land use patterns that would actually promote less traffic? And yes. not just compared to what would have happened otherwise, but maybe compared to nothing happening. That's, and it, you're right, it is counterintuitive. So we'll first start with what happens today under the existing general plan. Under the existing general plan, there, you know, the development takes place. Under any very, various uh, future scenarios, the development takes place. The difference with this plan is that there really are being measures put into, we say, 94% of the city, into the neighborhoods to start to really limit the development in the neighborhoods. What we've seen in the neighborhoods have been, because the value of residential is so great, what we've seen are teardowns of some of these great older apartments because they have ground level open space and now there's no requirement. So the first thing is in the neighborhoods, ground level open space requirements, uh, what we call conservation districts to really start to be a much more um, evaluative, that's not a good word, but to have much more input into any demolitions so that we really start to try and, and ratchet down what is happening in the neighborhood. So that's piece number one. And that is through all the mechanisms in the plan. Piece number two is the only area that there is development that would continue. And again, it no longer continues under the old general plan. It would be under existing zoning, would be on the transit corridors. And the only area where there is any increase whatsoever are in the couple of areas right on top of the transit stations. 
So you say, well, why wouldn't just stopping all development help? Again, you, you never get to stop all development, whether you have it happening over here in the residential neighborhoods or whether, let's say, over a 10-year period, you have um, less, but over the 10-year period, you still have a cumulative amount. You need to deal with the traffic issue directly. And we need to be able to say, okay, if there is going to be anything built here, you can't have the kind of parking you would have had in the past. You can't have the number of trips you would have had. We need to provide alternatives. You need to pay fees. You need to be part of a district where you're looking at moving people around differently. That, and again, it's not just new development. When you put together those districts and you take those fees, that also provides the basis for whether it's working with the schools or working with the existing businesses. We have to eliminate some of our existing trips. It's not just enough to say, let's ratchet back on the new. So we have to go after both. Uh, before you said um, it's inevitable that there will be some development, could Santa Monica literally s say we're shutting the doors down, change the zoning, and say nothing is going to happen? Um, or almost nothing is going to happen from here on in? Is that legally a possibility, um, let alone politically or community-wise? Well, legally, of course, you would face years of lawsuits because um, California as well as the rest of the country, you know, there has to be some, people have to have some ability to have some reasonable use of their property. Now, with that said, um, what would be reasonable use? Going through this effort with the community, we, we heard reasonable use has to be much lower than the old general plan. I mean, what you're looking at in many ways cuts almost in half what was in the existing general plan in terms of heights and things like that. Um, we felt that reasonable use had to be very focused and only where you could really get to the heart of the issue. And the heart of the issue that we heard from the community was we want this traffic and we want this congestion managed and we want our ability to move around managed at this uh, ability to move around freed up so this plan focuses on how to reduce the traffic how to really manage it in terms of putting in place districts a half a dozen districts throughout the city how to fund it whether that be the developer fees or grants or a variety of other things or having um, projects actually build some of what's needed. Um, so that is the whole basis here, is that reducing traffic, making it easier for people to have other options, is an undercurrent of where and how everything was located. But people also said to us, and we want, you know, there's a, a graphic that you can, you can put in your, um, your slideshow that said, people said, you know, we want complete neighborhoods. We want to be able to walk to a store. So do people want a new grocery store? Yes. Do people want a drugstore near them? Yes. So one of the things the plan does that's very important is strategically locates neighborhood serving retail. And by neighborhood, small floor plants, specific uses, but puts them in areas that they may not now exist so that people have what's called a complete neighborhood. People also talked about the health of the community, meaning more open space, uh, child care facilities, elder care facilities, all of these aspects, workforce housing and affordable housing, all of those aspects are part of a community that evolves. So I don't think a community ever stays the same. It either evolves where these, these human and these social values are met 
and you really try and structure it so that you diminish any of the negative impacts, the overwhelming the community with big buildings. People don't, they don't come to Santa Monica to live in the shadow of a high rise. If they wanted to live in the shadow of a high rise, they'd move downtown. So it's that balance of how do you keep some jobs, but they're local jobs and they're creative jobs. You do it with smaller floor, floor plates. You do it with a smaller amount that, um, or smaller areas that you designate. How do you have the ability to have the life, which is, you know, a floor or two of residential above the retail so that you have the activity and people will use the transit you have to have some of that residential for people to use the transit. Um, otherwise, we won't get the transit. I mean, it's, it's very, very simple. So on the corridors, like on Wilshire, we said the focus would be residential, ground floor retail, but above that, residential as opposed to office. So that you get the life, you get the activity, you get the complete neighborhood, you get the services, and you get the diversity. So I think when you look at really healthy communities, you have tremendous citizen involvement, you have a process structured different from our current process where people are involved in every aspect and they're involved in the determinations, the ability to say no. You know, that may provide this, this, and this benefit, but it's still not what we want, that capability. And that's how a community grows but keeps its character and sort of nourishes its soul. So you're suggesting that traffic issues and the attendant pollution, climate change, etc., cetera, um, can be dealt with through an evolution of the location of different uses and through more of a public transit-oriented um, infrastructure. Is there a role for increased density then because that comes back to the counterintuitive, more development. You're, in one way, you made an argument for different development, but is there a place for more development actually helping reduce traffic? That's a counterintuitive, yes. and is, is that actually playing or not? You know, when you look at all of the classic cities, you know, Vancouver, you know, New York, all of these big cities, obviously there's a direct co correlation between density and transit. This community is not one from everything we heard where people embraced, we want a lot more density. People were clear that around the transit stations and the stations, that might be the place so, where that you put some, a little additional density. If you're going to have the, even what would be the existing density that you would only have that along the transit corridors and you would only have it with meeting all of these transportation expectations so that you it supports the transit and you really have a very low traffic impact and you also the other so people were very clear that they did, and again, it was divided. You did have people who said, we think density is great, and we think it would be exciting to have much more on our boulevards. But many people said, you know, maybe in on those transit stations, maybe a little bit in order to create the life and the activity around the boulevards, a, kind of a couple places, but keep it away from our neighborhoods, and we don't, and we want to make sure that it contributes. In other words, you don't put residential in here and that results in those people having to make trips across town for their groceries. Uh, one of the things that we have seen, there is almost just slightly less number of trips from our trips, yours and mine, as compared with the commuters' trips. So in other words, commuters have trips that come in at peak hours. Into Santa Monica. Into Santa Monica. We've identified a whole range of strategies really focused at those commuter trips, at reducing them and eliminating a lot of it in the future. But the other set of trips 
that is just as great are the trips that all of us make to go to the grocery or to go to the hairdresser. And part of the long range strategy is when we talk about complete neighborhoods is trying to put the services, particularly where there might be new neighborhoods like the industrial area, put the basic services there so that people are not driving. For example, you do not want, um, even if it's a small office, you don't want an office where people have to drive to go get lunch. Those are all unnecessary trips. Uh, so that is part, part of it is not just saying no, part of it is saying, okay, where do we have to locate things so that people won't drive, and then what do we have to do to really make it safe, convenient, that we can significantly change um, those numbers. And what's amazing, you look at our downtown, and I don't want to give you the wrong number, it's extremely high number, uh, something like 40 or 50 percent, and I'll verify that number, people either have one car or no cars because, and I always use my, my own family, my husband and myself, as an example, we only have one car. We always had two cars back east because we walk to most of our services. That is placing those services and making sure that when something like an artist studio housing that's going in out in the industrial areas, it's going in without any services, without the ability to walk, without any open space nearby, making sure that doesn't happen. Because that's where half of our traffic comes from.